Kristen, as always. Hi, everyone. We are going to get started. So we will call uh, to official order the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation, the July 2022 meeting. Welcome uh, to all of those uh, that are joining us today via our Facebook Live um, on our Cook County Social uh, Innovation Commission um, uh, Facebook. Um, so we'll call to order. I will ask Alia uh, if uh, you can call attendance. Hello, everyone. So to start off with attendance, I'm going to start with Chair Anaya. Present. Vice Chair Lane. Present. Thank you, Celia. Commissioner Agliple. Mayor Osbury. Commissioner Austin. Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Brutus. Commissioner Present. Caliente. Oh, Present. Okay. Got Brutus. Okay. Um, Commissioner Caliento. Commissioner Cooley. Present. Okay. Commissioner De Laurentiis. Present. Commissioner Dubo. Commissioner Espinosa. Commissioner Flores. Present. Okay. Commissioner Freeman. Commissioner Guajardo. Present. I'm sorry, I couldn't get off mute. I'm present. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Guajardo. Alder Person Haddon. Present. Superintendent Killen. Good afternoon again. Present. Good afternoon. Um, Commissioner Males. Present. Good afternoon. Commissioner Malone. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Commissioner Norrington Reeves. Commissioner Raymer. Commissioner Rice. Commissioner Slizer. Present. Commissioner Thomas. Present. And Commissioner Yonan. Present. All right, thank you very much. So it does look like we have a quorum. So thank you everyone, um, all commission members um, that were able to join us today. Um, we are gonna begin with public testimony. So just as a reminder, anybody tuning in, uh, public testimony, whether it's uh, any type of request for the meetings or any written comment can be submitted up to 24 hours in advance um, of the meeting to uh, 7thdistrict.office at gmail.com. Uh, Talia, did we receive any requests or any testimony? Um, no, we did not. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the approval of the minutes. Uh, you all should have received them. Um, not sure if there are any questions or any edits to the uh, minutes from our last meeting. Please feel free to raise your hand or let us know if there's any edits or any questions regarding those minutes. Okay, don't see any on my end, so we will proceed. Uh, can I have a motion for approval of the June 2022 minutes? So motion so moved. moved by Commissioner Haddon. Everyone. By everyone. Uh, <laughs> can I get a second, uh, Commissioner Brutus? Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions? Okay. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it um, and the minutes are approved. Great. Uh, so our next um, item on the agenda is any updates from the chair and vice chair. Uh, uh, vice Chair Lane, did you have anything on your end? I do not have anything for this meeting. Uh, nor do I, Madam Chair. And okay. uh, I suggest with your permission, we move on to our expert witness. Absolutely. Take it away. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, we're uh, privileged to have with us today uh, Professor Jens Ludwig, who is 
a professor of public policy at the University of Chicago, and also the director of the University of Chicago's crime lab. Uh, his uh, topic is uh, tragically more timely than it at the time we uh, recruited him to give his test. He is uh, going to be offering his actionable social policy recommendations about how the county might uh, cost effectively reduce the unacceptably high rate of gun violence. I would say any rate of gun violence is high, uh, as well as uh, the rate of incarceration, similarly unacceptably high. And how to do that, uh, employing um, uh, behavioral science, which is area, his area of expertise. Uh, and uh, and I welcome him. And uh, Jen, so happy to have you with us. And I'm going to turn the floor over to you. And as I understand it, Thalia, uh, Professor Ludwig would prefer to advance his own slides so we can make him a co-host for that purpose. I would appreciate it. So welcome, uh, Jen. Yeah. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. Uh, thank you for, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, and um, as a resident of Cook County myself, thanks to the commission for everything that you're doing to make the, uh, to make the county better. Um, so let me see, I, I have, um, I have some slides. Can everybody, oh, you know what I, hold on. Let me, uh, let me do one thing before I, um, yes, let's do reading through. Uh, okay, so my apologies. So let me see, can everybody see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect, thank yep. you. Um, so what I wanted to do is, um, you know, un unfortunately the, the motivation for a lot of the work that I've been doing here at the University of Chicago for the last, the 15 years since I arrived in the city is um, is been working to address uh, a uniquely American problem. So let me start off just showing you this picture for starters, which is the murder rate per 100,000 people in different rich countries around the world. And, and the first thing that you can see in this graph <clears throat> is that the murder rate in the United States is dramatically higher than what you see in any other rich country in the world. Um, even in a country like Turkey, which I think just from looking at the news coverage, you get a sense that Turkey is a country that itself is struggling with a lot of social problems. Um, Turkey is looking at what's going on in the United States and, and wondering what in the world is happening. Um, and then the second thing that I want to add to that is um, now I've what I've done is I've color coded the, the height of each bar is the murder rate per 100,000 people. And I've color coded this now so that the blue part of every bar is the rate of murders per 100,000 people committed without guns. And the yellow part of every bar is the rate of murders committed basically per capita with guns. And what you can see is that um, the American exceptionalism with respect to the rate at which we kill one another is almost entirely driven by the use of firearms. Um, so this is the uniquely American problem that we're wrestling with. And, and unfortunately, if you zoom back and, and take a long-term look at the problem, we've made um, disappointingly little long-term progress on this. So if you look at mortality data for the United States going back to 1950 or even 1900, what you can see is that um, the rate at which people die from almost every leading uh, cause of death have plummeted in the United States for the last 50 or 100 years with two exceptions. One is cancer mortality and the other is, is homicides. Um, so we have not made much long-term progress as a country in figuring out how to solve this problem. And if you look at the city of Chicago, so what I've just told you is something that you probably already know, which is um, the problem is, is challenging. The, um, the, the, the thing that I want to sort of argue next is that the problem is not hopeless. So we can see examples. This is a graph that shows you the murder rate per 100,000 people for the three largest cities in the country, Chicago, LA, and New York, going back to the late 1800s. And you can see that despite the fact that these three cities are so different in every way in their population density and their geography and, and um, 
climate and so on, you can see that the murder rates per capita were remarkably similar for most of this 130 year period with two exceptions. One is the Al Capone era during the 1920s and 30s, and the other is uh, right now, the last 20 or 30 years in the city. And um, you can see that as recently as the early 1990s, Chicago, LA, and New York had very similar murder rates. And uh, since then, um, LA and New York have experienced, prior to the pandemic, they'd experienced declines in murder rates on the order of 80 to 90 percent. And in contrast, you can see that overall as a city, the murder rate in Chicago now is not all that much lower than what it was in the early 90s at the peak of the crack cocaine epidemic. So the problem is not hopeless, but we haven't made much progress on it in Chicago specifically. And you know, one of the things that people like to say here in, in Chicago is, well, um, at least the murder rate now is not, the rate of interpersonal violence is not what it was at the peak of the crack cocaine epi epidemic. And if you live in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood or a predominantly white neighborhood in Chicago, that's true. But if you live in a predominantly black neighborhood in the city of Chicago, that's no longer true. So you can see that the the murder rate per 100,000 people in predominantly black neighborhoods in Chicago is now substantially higher than it was in 1991 at the peak of the crack cocaine epidemic here. So another way to say this is Chicago has not made much progress, um, certainly not compared to the other two big cities in the country uh, in, in um, achieving public safety and even worse, Public safety disparities have been increasing substantially over time in our, uh, in our home city. So what I wanna um, argue is that a key reason that we haven't made more progress in addressing the problem is that we've put the wrong frame on the problem, okay? And so how have we understood the problem? What, what is the frame that we've put on the problem of gun violence and, and um, serious crime in America? Well. For the last 50 years, we can see this in survey data, but we can also see it in our, in our anecdotal experiences. Um, America has basically concluded for 50 years that the, the problem of, of serious crime that is bad acts are driven by quote, bad people. And you know, there's a reason that everybody in this meeting has heard, is familiar with the term super predator. It's a, uh, widely disseminated uh, idea that was enormously influential in shaping um, public policy responses to the problem of serious crime. And, and as I said, you can see in survey data that large majorities of Americans over the last 50 years attributed crime to the problem of um, bad people or bad actors. And if that's your understanding of what the driver of the, of the crime problem is, then um, it's not surprising that if you think that the people who are committing crime are fundamentally different from everyone else, either because they're, um, uh, they're sociopathic or they uh, have, have different morals or whatever your attribution would be of the cause, you're gonna conclude that the only thing that you can do to solve the crime problem is, is lock up those who, in, who engage in crime. And as everybody on this call knows, that's something that the United States has done in a way that has no historical or international precedent. Um, so you can see that the United States has the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world by far. If Illinois were its own country, we would also have the highest incarceration rate, um, much higher than any other place in the world. Now, the, the next thing that I wanna, what I wanna say is um, maybe the most important problem, the most important problem with the argument that crime is driven by bad people is that it seems to be wrong. That is to say, it doesn't seem to fit the facts as best as social science can understand them. One of the very first um, uh, social science studies that I was involved of, uh, involved with myself starting back in the 1990s was a, um, a large scale demonstration that the US Department of Housing and Urban Development um, implemented called Moving to Opportunity that basically offered um, families living in distressed public housing communities in five cities across the country the chance to get a housing voucher and move to a more um, economically and racially diverse community with a housing voucher. 
Um, and in Chicago, in the Sh Chicago is one of the five cities that participated in moving to opportunity and the uh, housing complex from which MTO families were, the place they were living in the 1990s when the demonstration started was the Robert Taylor homes, which are, as everybody probably remembers, located at uh, basically the intersection of State Street and Garfield Boulevard, just a couple miles from my house here in, um, in Hyde Park. And, um, and because there were more families who'd requested assistance to, to move than they had housing vouchers to give out, um, they basically flipped the coin to decide which families had the chance to, to relocate. And so the families who stayed in the Robert Taylor homes and the families who moved to more diverse neighborhoods like Hyde Park were, because uh, whether you moved or not was determined by a coin flip, the two groups were on average similar in every way except for the neighborhood environments in which the families were living. So akin to a, like a drug trial in medicine, we can confidently attribute any differences in subsequent family life outcomes to the neighborhood environment rather, to some, rather than to something else different about the families. And, and what you can see in the moving to opportunity data was that moving, just moving a couple miles from the Robert Taylor uh, project to a neighborhood like Hyde Park reduced the violent crime rate for uh, the violent crime arrest rate to teens in these families by something like 40%. Now, just reflect on what a large change that is in the risk of, of violent crime involvement for the kids in these families. And notice what's not changing. You know, when you move two miles from Garfield and, and uh, Garfield Boulevard and State Street to somewhere in Hyde Park, your moral character is not changing just by moving a couple miles, right? And so I think that really tells you the limitations of this frame that it's the um, uh, that it's something about the people themselves, and interestingly, so it's something about the social environment that that matters a lot for for crime involvement. And interestingly, in the moving to opportunity demonstration, the incomes of the MTO families themselves didn't change when they moved to to Hyde Park. So, so the MTO demonstration tells us it's something about the social environment um, that matters a lot for violence, but it's not merely the aspects of the social environment that we normally think of, okay? And so um, what I wanna to turn to next is uh, thinking about, um, uh, you know, what it is about the social environment that might matter and, um, uh, and what we might do about it. And, and to, to get there, to understand what's going on, maybe the, for the next observation I wanna make is, um, I think at least introspecting on my own sort of experiences, you know, I think most of us wind up having a um, misunderstanding of the causes of violence, partly because we have a misunderstanding of what violence itself looks like in the real world, because for so many people, our main source of information about the violence problem comes from, um, from, uh, news accounts and from um, entertainment. Basically, media sources shape our understanding of the violence problem. And, you know, if you think about like popular entertainment like The Wire, the picture of violence that you get there is like, you know, um, Snoop Pearson and Chris Paltrow going out to do a hit on behalf of, you know, Marlo Stansfeld's drug selling gang as these two gangs are fighting over uh, drug selling turf. The image that you get is of gun violence as being like very, very premeditated, right? And you get a sense of people engaging in gun violence because they're deeply committed, they've thought about this, they're planful. That gives you a sense of people being very hard to dissuade from, from that, right? And actually what you see when you look closely at, um, at gun, this is a little bit uh, harder to figure out than, than you would think, but after having um, spent many years looking into this, you know, most violence uh, shootings in Chicago, like most American cities is very different from that. You know, so like one canonical example is a, a shooting that happened just a couple of miles south of my house here in, uh, in Hyde Park in South Shore at 73rd and Coles Avenue a few years ago, two groups of kids arguing over whether, 
you know, somebody in one group stole a bike from somebody in another group, right? That, that's what most gun violence um, is in Chicago and, and American cities, if you, most American cities, if you look at, for example, the data from the Chicago Police Department, you can see the overwhelming majority of murders where the police think they understand the motive for the, uh, for the murder, it stems from an altercation, right? And, and what are those, another way to sort of see this is most murders start with words. They start with words and, um, you know, usually in many of these murders, both parties had an opportunity to de-escalate and instead took it the other way. And so there's some series of escalation, escalations when there could have been de-escalation and then it results in a tragedy because someone's got a gun ready at hand. And, and that's the thing that is uniquely American here. It's not that we're Americans are more likely to get into arguments than people in, in the United Kingdom, for instance, it's that we have three to 400 million guns floating around and, and they don't in the UK. So our arguments then, our normal social frictions are much more likely to lead to tragedies um, because of gun availability. Um, doing something, as we can all see from, um, from the news coverage, doing something about gun availability, availability in the United States is proven to be enormously difficult. So what else can we do to try and address the, the problem? Okay. And so that leads you to sort of think about um, the, the behavior that then sort of results in, um, in shootings and, and what can we, if you think about gun violence equals guns plus violence, if guns are very difficult to do something about um, in the foreseeable future, given the political environment in the United States, what can we do to, um, to address sort of the violence part of the problem? And, and what I wanted to do is just um, talk you through a different sort of perspective that we've been developing um, at my research center about what's driving violent behavior. Um, and you know, if we were in person, what I would do is I would ask you to participate in an audience, uh, an audience participation game where I'd ask you to sort of call out the color of the object in the middle of the slide that I show you. And we'd do a practice run and everyone would say black. And then you'd say, whatever that color is, I'm a little bit colorblind, I think that's red. And then you'd say green and then you'd say yellow. And then here, most of you would wind up saying blue rather than orange, right? And if you've had a uh, psychology class at some point in your, in your background, you'd recognize this as something called the Stroop test. This is one of the most, um, most widely used tests in psychology. And, and what is the Stroop test doing? The Stroop test is illustrating something very fundamental about psychology. If you've read this book, this wonderful book by um, Princeton psychologist, Danny Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the big advances in psychology over the last 50 years is, an, is the realization that the human brain works very different from how we all imagine it to. So we all imagine thinking to be the thinking that we normally think of as thinking, is we, you know, we imagine thinking to be conscious, deliberate thought of the sort that, you know, ideas like consciously running through our minds. And what psychologists have learned is that sort of deliberate conscious thinking is enormously mentally taxing for people. And it's so taxing that all of us try and do as little of it as possible. And so what we do instead is we develop a bunch of automatic responses that are adaptive to situations we encounter over and over again every day. And we do them without even thinking about it. So psychologists call that system one automatic cognition. Like, and here's, so let me then sort of talk you through this in the context of this group test and then I'll help you see why I, I think this is related to um, the problem of gun violence in Cook County as well. And then it, opens the door to some, I think, um, effective and, and, and fairly low cost ways of addressing the gun violence problem. So um, what is a, you know, what the Stroop test is illust illustrating is, you know, what is a situation that all of us encounter in our daily lives over and over again, we see text. Imagine if you had to sort of deliberately think every time you see a word, should I read the word or should I not read the word? And you thought that through your life would just be exhausting, right? And so we see 
text in our daily life and we develop an uh, automatic response that's adaptive that says see word, re read word. And that works very well for most of the situations that we see in our daily lives. But once in a while, we come across out of the ordinary situations, which is what the Scroop test puts us into, right? In the Scroop test, the instructions are see, see the word, say the color, which is very different from our normal situation, which is see the word, read the word, is the, is the adaptive response, is the right response that you should be doing, right? Now, what does that have to do with the problem of gun violence? Well, you know, we, we, know, um, you know, we know from talking to people who run community NGOs on the south and west sides of Chicago from, you know, um, lots and lots of different sources, we know that unfortunately in the most sort of distressed, disadvantaged, disinvested neighborhoods, of Chicago and Cook County more generally, the like the institutions in those neighborhoods that normally keep people safe, that young people depend on to keep them safe, can be get, can get overwhelmed. Teachers, uh, clergy, um, you know, you uh, social workers, you name it, um, uh, can get overwhelmed. And so kids learn that when they're challenged, when they're challenged growing up. The, the right response uh, for navigating their, their daily lives in, in their neighborhood is to push back when you're challenged and push back hard, regardless, even regardless of the severity of the provocation, just push back. And, you know, one way to think about it is like, you know, um, today someone challenges you, for, demands your lunch money. If you Tell them yes and give hand over your lunch money today. Tomorrow they're coming for your winter coat. The day after that, they're coming for your cell phone. Right. And so kids basically learn that they've got to establish a reputation for not being an easy target in their neighborhoods. And so they learn when I get challenged, I've got to push back. Now that unfortunately might be the right thing to do for most of the situations that kids encounter growing up in, the, in their neighborhoods, but it can lead to a tragedy when someone's got a gun. Okay. And that perspective on the gun violence problem also helps you see why neighborhoods matter so much for the rate at which kids get involved in, in crime. So I've got two kids, one who are growing up here in Hyde Park with me, uh, a nine-year-old and an 18-year-old daughter. And, you know, Hyde Park is a very well-resourced neighborhood. So the University of Chicago puts a security guard on, you know, almost every street corner in, in Hyde Park. And so my kids learn, you know, when someone demands your lunch money, the right response or challenges you about anything, the right response is do whatever the person says, and then just go tell a security guard on the corner. They're wearing a bright blue or bright sort of greenish jacket that says University of Chicago Security, and then they'll call the police or they'll tell a teacher or whatever they're going to do. And, you know, my kids learn that that's the automatic response. And there are never any out of the ordinary situations that they encounter that requires them to ever do anything different, if that makes sense, right? The right response that they learn every day, just comply, just go along, is also the right response when someone's got a gun. Now, to say this differently, it's not that the kids growing up in Hyde Park are any different from the kids growing up anywhere else on the south side of Chicago or on the west side of Chicago. It's that the neighborhood environments are less demanding of the kids. That's, I think, a radically different sort of perspective of the gun violence problem that we're trying to solve. Or, or another way to sort of say this is, I was visiting the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center um, a few years ago. So I think most of the people here will, will be familiar with the JTDC. It's a facility on Roosevelt Road on the west side of the city where you know, the kids who the juvenile justice system deems are at highest risk for, violent, for, for uh, recidivism, they're held awaiting resolution of their case by the juvenile court system, okay. And so we're talking to one of the team leaders there um, and he's saying to us, he's saying, you know, I, I the team leader, uh, you know, he runs uh, like a staff team that, uh, that runs one of the, the residential pods, they call it inside the facility. He's like, I tell the kids in here all the time, if I could give you back just 10 minutes of your lives, none of you would be here. And it really represents a very dramatic mindset shift for the problem. It's the problem is not bad people driving the violence problem. It is largely a problem of normal human beings 
um, getting caught up in very difficult 10 minute situations. And so a lot of what we've been doing at, the, at my research center at the University of Chicago has been working with NGOs that in different ways are running programs that I'm, I'm happy to talk more about um, sort of the details of, but basically running programs that help young people recognize these high state 10, 10 minute windows and recognize when they're about to do something without thinking that's gonna to lead to tragedy and just slow down and, and, and have a second thought about what they're doing, right? To, to reconsider and navigate the 10 minute window. And you know, we've been structuring a lot of these studies like the moving to opportunity demonstration, basically like the sort of randomized control trial that gives you um, gold standard evidence in, in medicine. Um, so what the results that I'm about to tell you are not um, wishful thinking, these are, you know, these are results that are about as convincing as we ever get in the public policy area. And so when we partnered with Youth Guidance, the nonprofit that runs a, the Becoming a Man program, these were the first studies that we did at the crime lab, we see that, um, you know, enrolling thousands of kids around the south and west sides of Chicago, we see that, you know, um, one school year of uh, of being and becoming a man reduces the rate at which kids or can reduce the rate at which kids are arrested for violent crimes by about half. Amazing reductions, amazing reductions in rates of violence involvement, okay? Um, and, you know, we've been working with the Chicago public schools in the city. Uh, so the Becoming a Man program works um, inside the school setting. It's working with kids who are still showing up to school. And you know the challenge with that is like, we know a lot of the kids who most need help are the kids who are already disengaged from school. Is there a way to also work with the higher, highest needs kids who aren't in school anymore? And so um, you know, our research center in the Chicago Public Schools several years ago, we uh, started working with um, children, Children's Home and Aid and YAP, uh, Youth Advocates Program, um, two local nonprofits, to study a program called Choose to Change that works with higher needs populations, kids who are much more loosely connected to school. And um, we see similarly large reductions in violent crime arrests, in CPS misconduct, in, um, you know, we see increases in school attendance. So we see really encouraging results there. Um, we've been working with um, Heartland Alliance um, and a bunch of uh, a bunch of NGOs that they partner with as well on a program that works with um, 20 and 30 something year old men. Um, a program called Ready that's based on similar sort of principles, and you can see here that you know that there's some noise in the data, so there's some imprecision at the data, but I think the you know there's like a an 80 80% chance that the program reduces the, viol the shooting involvement of guys in the program by something like 60%, right? So it doesn't meet the usual sort of statistical significance test that scientists demand for publication in a peer reviewed journal. But if you're, you know, if you're running a, a city or a county and you look at those results, you think very, very high chance that this program generates absolutely massive reductions in gun violence involvement um, to the participants. And then let me just sort of close by um, saying, you know, we even did this um, inside the JTDC a few years ago when Earl Dunlap was the temporary administrator for the JTDC. Um, he started to get the detention staff to do this sort of, the kids would go to the Nancy B. Jefferson CPS school in the morning. And then in the afternoon at that time, they were mostly just hanging out in their pod area watching TV. And so Earl started to change pod by pod, that is residential section uh, by residential section of the facility to get to train up the staff to basically do some of this programming to help kids learn how to slow down in these 10 minute windows in the afternoon instead of just watching TV. And about halfway through converting these residential centers, there was some union litigation that sort of froze it in place and he couldn't then do this in the rest of the residential units. 
And so there was a period where they were basically flipping a coin to decide which of the residential units new kids would go into. So half the kids were getting the, the programming and half the kids weren't, again, just like a randomized trial. And you could see um, sizable reductions in return rates for kids who wound up getting the program um, relative to the kids who weren't getting the program. Just, and this is like through 18 months, you can see the huge majority, unfortunately, of the kids leaving JTDC wind up coming back. And this sort of, notice how low cost this program is, right? You've got the kids, you've got the building, you've got the staff. The, the only extra cost of doing the program basically is just training the staff to, uh, to deliver it in the afternoon, uh, to have the kids do this instead of just watching TV. And so as I sort of um, reflect on this, I look at the moment that we're in, and you know, I think we can all see that gun violence, in, in the survey data that I've seen, gun violence is the number one priority to people in Chicago and, and presumably in other parts of Cook County as well, by, by a lot, um, by a lot. And I see opportunities to deliver for starters. Let me say, for, there are lots of other things that I could imagine as well, but given that this is the Cook County Commission, I was trying to think, what, is the, what are the easiest to implement things that the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation could recommend that the county do to address this problem? And I think for me, two no-brainer things to do is to make sure that the JTDC is still doing this as widely as possible with as high quality um, of delivery as possible. And I know that uh, Sheriff Dart has been running some pilot programs based on these the same sort of principles inside the jail. Um, the, the latest data that I could find myself, so you all might have updated information, but the latest data that I could find myself from public sources suggested that the, it's called the SAVE program inside the Cook County Jail was operating at pretty modest scale. And so I think another thing that I would strongly recommend myself the commission think about is whether there aren't ways for the county to work with the sheriff to greatly expand that, to do that as widely as possible with as high, um, high quality delivery as possible as well. So let me, um, let me stop there. Let me thank the commission for having me and, and thank you for your time. And, um, and I welcome any reactions, questions, comments that you, uh, that you might have. Chance, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, and insightful presentation. I'm sure the uh, commissioners have uh, questions and comments to send your way. Commissioner Mills has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Jens, my name's Howard Mails. I longtime Hyde Parker for uh, decades. And um, I wondered as I looked at your charts, if you could help us understand something that isn't quite there, and that's okay, because you can do this verbally. The shift you had from kids, as you call kids, and then adults. Um, if I look at the murders that you had in New York, city, us, and other cities, um, or even on the wire, if you go to Baltimore, uh, are, how are our kids doing, Jens? And I understand, you know, that if Arnie can, Duncan can go out and we can offer someone 40 bucks and they'll turn their gun over, but they're in a certain age group that where they're willing to do that, things work differently, the grown up, the adult mind, um, I studied social psychology at U Chicago. So, the, you know, the adult mind is formed, the kids' minds are forming. And what can you tell us about our kids in Cook County? What can you tell us about our adults when it comes to this kind of gun violence? Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, um, so let me, let me say, um, let me say, let me say just a, a couple quick things, and if these are, if this is not a responsive response, then please follow up and steer steer me in whatever other direction would be helpful. So, the first thing to say is, for a wide variety of reasons, most of the social programming that America does. So this is not just specific to Chicago and Cook County, but most of the social programming that America does is for young people. I'm saying kid, like at, at my age, anyone under the age of. 50 as a kid, but let's say 18 and under is what I mean specifically here as a kid. 
um, you know, partly because we spend so much money on the public school system and it's such a natural touch point to deliver social programs and, and so on and so on, right? But when you look at the, the data on who's involved in gun violence, it's, I think you're anticipating this answer, but I just wanna say it explicitly so everybody clearly understands it. The large majority of the people who commit shootings and the people who are shot are over the age of 18. It's, it's a problem that's very, very, that's overwhelmingly driven by 20 and 30 something people and especially 20 and 30 something men. And that's a population that the US social safety net is not devel well developed to help. You know, we, we built a social safety net going back to the 1930s um, or before that assumed that sort of working age men would be working. And, you know, maybe that's like a, a reasonable assumption for lots of time periods in lots of places. But I think you can see the unemployment rates that we have on the west side, west and south side of Chicago. There's some sort of structural problem in, in the economy or society as a whole that we, we need to sort of rethink that sort of question. So, so I just wanna underscore the huge importance of thinking of things that we can do to be helpful to working age men, not just kids. And then I would say, like, when you look at the comparison across cities, you can see that relative to LA and New York, relative to LA and New York, Chicago, both young people and adults are not doing very well in Chicago compared to New York and LA. So that tells us that we can do a much better job, right? In the early 1990s, LA and New York were just like Chicago. And everything that people are saying in Chicago right now, like there's no way that we're ever gonna solve this problem, blah, blah, blah. That's exactly what they were saying in LA and New York in 1991. And the murder rates dropped by 80 and 90% respectively since then. So the problem is solvable. Um, but our young people and our adults are not doing a, uh, a great job. I, I would say at the same time, Chicago is not unique in struggling with this problem. You know, um, if you look at the murder rate per capita, Chicago is not that different from what you see in like Baltimore and St. Louis. And so, I mean, the way to, here's the way that I would think about Chicago. The downtown and north side of the, of the city basically have the same murder rate as New York City. And the south and west sides, unfortunately, have murder rates like what you see in Baltimore and St. Louis. And so, you know, people like to talk about the tale of two cities. It's very much the, the case um, for the public safety environment in Chicago. And uh, unfortunately, that's as true for young people as it is for adults. I hope that's a helpful answer. Thank you very much. And, and you know, the thing is that I think for most of us, when uh, no, when I first came from New York to Chicago in 76, um, I felt that there was a lot to be improved. And I'm hopeful that your work that the Crime Lab is doing, thankful, grateful that people are looking at this and always looking for where, you know, one can make a difference with the children or of adults or both where we get to start. So I thank you so much. Yes, you addressed it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Brutus. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, first of all, Mr. Ludwig, uh, what a very powerful and impactful report that you uh, provided us and shared with us here today. I am, I am uh, enthralled by the information that I just witnessed and I am um, just feeling a whole lot of different uh, things, emotions, but um, one, I'm glad this is being recorded so I can look back at this and watch it. I hope that you'll also make available to the commission a copy of this uh, report and document for us to, you know, put in our archives and review later if we so choose. But uh, one thing that stuck out to me that I want to ask you about is the slide that you um, um, showed with um, an example of your children and compliant behavior. Um, can, you, can you go into a little bit more about that? Because to me, that signals, you know, a lot of different things, right? The, maybe a discrepancy in child rearing practices based on, you know, from different communities. Um, 
you know, how the social economic conditions impact those decisions, the real time and real life environmental factors of how decisions are made where, um, you know, you don't necessarily adhere to social norms and are unconstrained uh, that, you know, cause them to react a certain way or to, you know, make what we would consider, you know, unhealthy uh, choices. So, like, could you go into some of that and some of your research behind that? Because I just found that very, um, like, that dynamic is just extremely um, prov provocative. So. Yeah, sh sure. So maybe what I would, um, let me think about the right, you know, I, I have a, uh, I, I have a, a, a good friend who grew up in the Austin neighborhood of Chicago on the west side of the city. And the way that he put this once was, um, you know, uh, was complying is like opening the floodgates to future victimization, right? And I think that is the unfortunate reality that way too many young people are forced to navigate themselves outside of the home all the time uh, growing up um, in uh, difficult situations on, on the south and west sides. And I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think of this, so think about the moving to opportunity experiment again. This is why I think that's such a helpful sort of touchstone to get a sense of what's going on. It's like in the, in the moving to opportunity demonstration that HUD ran starting in the 1990s, they're taking families out of the Robert Taylor homes and giving some a chance to move to Hyde Park while some remain in the Robert Taylor uh, housing developments. They're not there anymore, right? But um, this was back in the 1990s. So notice like the, the parent, the, the, the child rearing styles of the parents are the same for the families, or at least they, they started off exactly the same for the families. They, these were all just a bunch of families living in the Robert Taylor homes originally, and then by luck, some families get to move and some families stay behind. So there were no initial differences in how the adults thought of how they should raise their kids or whatever. It's the reality of the social neighborhoods that kids had to learn to navigate on their own. You know, and, and maybe I'm sure they're talking to their parents for, for you know, thoughts about what they should be doing. But the reality is much, maybe one way to sort of say this is the the neighborhood reality is much less forgiving at Garfield Boulevard and State Street than it is in Hyde Park. Is one way to is one way to think about it, and that unforgivingness is the thing that then leads to, you know, anybody living in that environment then has to shape the way they learn to navigate such an unforgiving uh, environment. And I think that's what the HUD moving opportunity demonstration shows you, like literally the same sets of kids living in one, growing up in one neighborhood versus another neighborhood. The kids are basically the same on average. The parents are basically the same on average. The social environment leads to very big differences in, in the risk of subsequent violence involvement, if that makes sense. And I think there are, things that you can do to change the social environment. And then there are also things that are easily within the control, I believe, of the Cook County government that you can do to work with high needs kids to, to better navigate these difficult environments that they're growing up in. Yeah, can I just redirect for a quick second, uh, Vice Chair? Please. Follow up question real quick, thank you. Um, so you juxtapose the Robert Taylor home situation scenario with Hyde Park, and I don't think you're wrong to do that, right? But um, I think we also should, you know, be prepared for in maybe the next 10 to 15 years to see that kind of data skew as Hyde Park, um, I, in, in my estimation, and just my looking at Hyde Park as a community that's a bubble, that you know makes it an exception on the south side. I think that bubble is going to pop, in the sense that where you're going to see, you know, folks who uh, are around that bubble, Woodlawn, Washington Park, you know, uh, Grand Boulevard, Bronzeville, as you know, um, that kind of safety bubble, or you know, whatever our perceptions are about Hyde Park being a safe, you know, neighborhood. I think 
some of that is going to shrink a little bit. And I think we're probably going to see some data skew a little bit in terms of Hyde Park as being that, that unique place, right? That can be a compare, comparison neighborhood to some of these kinds of data points you're talking about. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, you know, I, I, um, I, I it's, uh, you know, I, I would be, um, I'd be uh, hesitant myself to make any sort of confident prediction of what's going to happen on the, on the sad side, just because cities are such complicated entities. But maybe the one thing that I would just say is like the ideal, the ideal situation, right? And LA and New York show us that this can, can be realized. The ideal situation is not for the public safety bubble of Hyde Park to shrink, but rather the public safety public safety to expand all across the south and south and west sides of the city, right? And, and again, I think, you know, how New York and LA got there might be very different from the solution that Chicago decides to get there. But the fact that you have these two cities that were struggling in the same way we were in 1991, um, turned things around so dramatically over the last 30 years, tells us that it, that it can be done. Thank you, Commissioner Thomas. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Carrie Thomas. I work uh, for the state right now. Prior to that, I worked for many years at the Chicago Jobs Council. Um, and I really um, appreciate you underscoring the point about adults, um, because one of the things that I've been in workforce development for a long, long time in a couple of states, um, and one of the things I notice is that in a resource constrained environment, we um, we, we seek to fix young people because we think that'll have the best benefit. And in particular in workforce development, I'm always concerned because we talk about disconnected young people, opportunity youth, whatever the term is. And I have always felt pretty strongly that the adults you're describing were once those young people who never got anything. Now they're adults for whom there isn't, there really isn't much at all, as you pointed out. So I just really appreciate that. and. I'm always trying to be like, it's both and, like you have to have both strands to think about. So I would just really appreciate the presentation. And I did have a question about the other cities. Um, is there any, so sort of twofold question, is there anything to be learned from them? And did they do anything similar to like what Becoming a Man is doing or Ready is doing um, in, in those interventions? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the, um, one of the ways, so uh, both LA and New York, I think, have two things in common. Um, one thing that they did is that they, you know, if you sort of think about, assume for the moment, you, you might not, you might not um, be persuaded by the argument that I'm making, but let's assume for the moment, hypothetically, that you are persuaded that the problem is guns in these 10 minute windows, right? Like things go sideways and someone's got a gun. There are two ways to address those 10 minute windows. And one is, as I've argued, you know, with these social programs, you can teach people to sort of de-escalate themselves. And another thing that you can do is to have people around who can step in and de-escalate them. And, you know, the story that people tell about Chicago and LA, they're two stories that people tell about both cities. One is that they just made their police departments much more professionalized and effective. And, you know, using, you know, taking them basically out of the 19th century as institutions and bringing them into the 21st century and just making them operate like more like high performing modern day institutions that are doing what they're supposed to do so that you have Police in principle is represent one set group of people who can step in and mediate and de-escalate when things are, are getting heated. Ideally, that's what we would like. And so that's one thing that um, criminologists say is part of the story of, uh, of LA and New York. And the second thing that both, this is related, both, both cities did is they put a real emphasis on building bridges and supporting um, building bridges between the police department and community violence intervention organizations that use street outreach workers and violence interrupters to step in and de-escalate these 10 minute windows as well. You know, I have a lot of friends who 
uh, worked at LAPD over the last 30 years. And so they saw all these changes and, you know, they, they were in leadership positions and they talk about going to frontline officers and saying like, look, these, these neighborhood groups can make your lives much easier. They are trying to help you do the thing that you want. You need to learn to get along with these organizations and work together and, you know, and so on and so on. And I think it's fair to say that like we have not reached a point yet. Let me, let me be optimistic and say yet. I don't, I think it's fair to say that we have not quite reached that point in Chicago yet where the police department and the NGO is doing this work on the South and West sides are working together as sort of cooperatively and, and seamlessly as we're seeing in some of these other cities. Thank you. Commissioner Malone. Thank you. Um, so first things first, thank you so much for coming to present to us today. We, we really enjoyed it, obviously. Um, another a, a point to something that you just mentioned uh, in a comment is, you know, having done the work in a community like Inglewood to do the community policing, work with the seventh district, plan events together, 20 events, you know, and for a time, the seventh district was deemed by many to be the model for community policing. And um, having trained recruits, you find that you can't legislate motivation. You, some people are there for community. Some people are there for paying for school. Some people are there for living out their best bad boys fantasy, right? Like everyone's kind of there for a different reason and you can't necessarily legislate that. And I think one of the, I was excited that you brought up the concept, the content around socialization, because yes, we do need to work with adults and children. And yes, we do need to think about behavioral psychology and then also how we frame situational occurrences. Like everyone is undergirded by the value that we want security. And then the idea that we want safety in a lot of ways is also a fear-based concept. So if we need to be kept safe, we have to be kept safe from something or someone. And we're always going to be informed by our biases, whatever those are, about who that person is or what that situation is. And so when you're in a community that is lacking in resources and you are constantly indoctrinated with the idea that you have to be kept safe, you're always going to be fearful and people make rational, irrational decisions out of fear. Um, and no one is exempt from that. And so one of the things um, that I'm always intrigued by in the gun violence conversation is obviously gun violence as a public health issue and something that should be tackled with the social determinants of health. Because when we really think critically of undergirding our, undergirding our society in the context of wellness, health, well-being, quality of life, vitality, and quality care and access for all people, our solutions and our design look different. And so I'm not necessarily convinced that a traditional or even a reformed public safety model is going to be the thing that makes people feel healthy, well, and, and secure um, because the design is for safety as opposed to wellness and well-being and fruitful outcomes because of wellness and well-being. And so I'm, I'm interested in if you have been engaged in any of that work, the crime lab is engaged in any of that work because I know, um, well, violence interrupting is critical and obviously resourcing communities is going to be critical. Um, it is also interesting to me to think about designing concepts for how we engage in communities with a thought of wellness. Example of this might be, if I get pulled over tomorrow for a broken headlight or tail light, there's literally no way for me to know that before I get in my car, unless there's someone outside my car and I'm pumping the brakes and they're telling me before I drive off. So when you stop me, is the response to give me a ticket or is the response to say, hey, listen, we've got a program where we've got 20 auto shops within one mile here. We're gonna give you a voucher that you can use in the next 30 days to get your bite bulb done for five bucks. Like that to me centers wellness for all and is like a yeah. response to safety, right? Like versus punitive. And so I'm, yeah. I'm interested in how much of our conversations around gun violence, how much our conversations around wellness and well-being and our approach to it are centered in, um, you know, thinking critically about um, not just conflict de-escalation, de but shifting culture and mindset around punitive action as a first response to conflict. Yeah. And any yeah, I, 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 love, I love the question and agree with, with everything that you're saying and, and think it's like super complimentary to that. Are, let, me, let me maybe just 
paraphrase and re-say what you're saying in slightly different to, to more explicitly sort of connect the way I'm thinking about it with what you just said, which is, you know, I think for like your 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 broken taillight or headlight example is perfect because you can you can see lots of you can see lots of sort of government actors like law enforcement agencies around the country that might be on the bubble about what the right thing to do is for a broken taillight or headlight because because there it's very easy to see that the person with the broken taillight is the same as you or me right it's like who has not had a broken taillight and so there's no like othering would be one way to say it for something like a broken taillight and i think the no, unfortunately, in practice, there is still, you know, people doing crummy things like giving you a ticket and talking to you in a crappy way when they pull you over and, you know, whatever, whatever, right? But there's a chance that you can sort of see, oh, the driver of this car is just like me, you know, when I pull you over, whatever, whatever. I think the leap that we have not, as a country, been able to make yet is even the people involved in the most serious violence are not the other either. You know, that, that you know, swap my neighborhood for, for your neighborhood or, you know, whatever it is, right? It's like, even the people doing, you know, doing the crimes that wind up on the headline of the Chicago Tribune or the Sun-Times are not fundamentally different from anyone else. And I think that is the thing that we need, that I'm, I'm trying to, in some small way, help establish because you need to believe that first before, like, that seems like a precondition in order to start recognizing that that wellness is even a thing that you would care, you know, like if you if you view the people involved in gun violence as quote super predators, the last thing that people that the public is interested in doing is investing resources into the wellness of super predators. If instead you view this as an issue of like, you know, these are teenagers just like my teenager you have a completely different sort of mindset on it. And so I think that you're absolutely right. And I, you can sort of see, I'm, I've been kind of thinking myself of what, what sort of frames on this problem can lead people to this sort of the exact same place that, that you are as well. So thank you very much for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Cooley, please. Thank you, Professor, for your presentation today. I'm with the Chicago Food Policy Action Council and had the fortune, good fortune to visit um, the JTDC recently, partly because of one of the uh, policies we passed out of the council, uh, the commission a few years ago, it's called the Good Food Purchasing Policy, which set standards around the food that served, including the JDD, JTDC, and was able to tour the full facility and see the pods and some of their after school, and you know, some of their programming. They have an active barber shop right now, and, but it was clear from talking to this, the folk, the kids who were there, that there's a real lack of opportunity on a consistent basis for active engagement. And even you know, when the folks who are running the meal program are really trying to improve the quality of food um, and the content that's in it, um, and paying attention to the, the folks, the kids who were there needs around the food as well, which I think is part of the humanizing treatment for them. But like there was an underused garden that's on the basketball court up top. But so when you talk about policies, when you're talking about the investment into the JTDC for the programming, particularly what would you recommend as policy coming from the commission? And also thinking about some of the labor issues that you mentioned earlier that kind of held up some of the changes that we should be thinking about here and at the jail, like what would be the things you'd really want to see us be able to? Yeah, my, so my, um, my understanding, like the, the um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer and I'm certainly not a labor lawyer. So, you know, I, um, but I, is my understanding that the union issues were eventually um, resolved and that this sort of programming, um, you know, the jargony term for it is, uh, I, I think of it as behavioral science, but the jargony term for it is CBT. Um, that that the union issues were resolved, and there was a period where the facility was doing this every afternoon for uh, in all the pods for all the kids. And I think 
Since Earl Dunlap left, my understanding is that the degree to which that is still being done in the JTBC is very hit or miss. Now, I wouldn't say that that's the only sort of programming that we should do inside the JTDC, like far from it, right? But it is such a low cost, easy thing to do because it is just training the staff that you already have to deliver this at a time where the only other thing the kids would normally do is watch TV. It just seems to me like a no brainer. And I think the same sort of logic carries me over to, to the jail, right? Where you have like, not everybody inside the adult facility is, is going to necessarily be interested in participating or whatever, but there are lots of people inside the Cook County Jail, and certainly a lot of them are sitting there at any point in time thinking, this is not an experience I want to go through again. I would love to never show up at 26 in California again in my life, and we are missing opportunities right now to help them never go back to 26 in California. Right. And that like the save program is an example of something that I believe is being done closer to a pilot scale than to like a full blown operational scale. And that to me feels like another missed opportunity. So it would be reinstating what the ensuring that the JTDC is doing now what they once were doing and helping the jail take the save program and serving it with as high quality as possible to as many people as possible. And I'm not claiming that's the miracle cure for the problems of the county, but you are the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation. You have the ear of Cook County. Cook County runs these two detention facilities. These are both very low extra cost things that I think could be done starting like literally tomorrow. And it would be one more you know, small but important feasible step, I hope, to helping make the county better. And then with the Ready program, I also worked with an organization who was one of the partners, on the ground partners with Ready. What would, are, are there any policy recommendations that we could take forward as well for kind of helping to support and expand those programs? Yeah, I, you know, uh, I, I don't, so you are, you are now pushing me into a place where like I have to admit, you know, complete ignorance, which is like, I don't even begin to understand the different financing, like how county financing for any sort of social programming relates to city financing or state or federal. But what I would say is like, we're accumulating a set of evidence-based programs like, like Ready, like Choose to Change, like Becoming a Man, that are in operation in, you know, at a scale that's much smaller than they need to be on the south and west sides of Chicago. And I'm sure there are other parts of Cook County outside of Chicago where we need these programs as well. And anything that the county could do to ensure that as many people who would benefit can benefit because the financing is there, I think would be great. And what the details of that look like, I think you all would understand much, much better than I do. Thank you. Anyone else have uh, any further questions? Because I have a couple. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that the other commissioners have an opportunity first. So, um, Jens, this presentation has been extraordinarily uh, helpful, uh, and I have um, kind of an unfair and unrealistic question to ask you, and one that puts you on the spot, and I have little or no expectation that I'm going to get an answer that's going to be entirely satisfying. So with that premise, um, we're operating in an environment of public policy, and uh, public policy's cousin or step-cousin is politics. And here we're inviting, um, we're working with the variety of government units given our federal system. And we're in an environment of uh, polarization. I needn't explain to anyone. Uh, and um, given your expertise in terms of behavioral science, if we look at the daily mass shootings in this country, and we look at um, hate crimes, and we look at the predominance of killers in those circumstances being uh, white males, ages 20, 21, 22. Um, and we see the focus, at least conversationally, on mental illness, but then we have the predominance of guns in the country. Uh, we have different interpretations of the Second Amendment. We have a Supreme Court 
acting the way it is now acting. And my question to you is looking at this from the perspective of behavioral science. And again, I know this is an unfair question and probably an unrealistic one as to any of those um, multiple factors. Are, are, are there any workarounds you might suggest from a, from a policy perspective that we might entertain introducing within the county as kind of a, a beta site, uh, recognizing that what we may want to have happen at the federal level, for example, is unlikely to happen in yeah. the near term. Are there, are there things that you might suggest that we can think about uh, in terms of moving the dial here just from an incentive, disincentive point of view, from a, you know, recognizing what we're all up against because, you know, every day it seems is another tragedy, you know, yeah. and and uh, I, I very much appreciate your uh, exposition about the dynamic that occurs on the west and south sides when one young man, perhaps feeling lack of power, lack of hope, uh, challenged by another young man might be able to go to uh, somebody either officially or unofficially, whether it's community policing or somebody standing in that stead. I think that's that's great. That obviously is a very expensive proposition generally if we seek to expand that broadly throughout the county. Although I think it's you know certainly something worth exploring. Um, but I'm just kind of looking at this other piece of the puzzle with these mass shootings, the predominance of guns, having more guns in this country than people. Yeah. Um, are there are there are there psychological behavioral workarounds that we might want to explore that could form policy, even if we look at this as kind of uh, social experimentation, that from which we might learn lessons, and those lessons themselves may be applied here, but also elsewhere. Yeah, maybe I would just say I would say two things. One is. Um... You know, the, um, the, the, the state, the county, and the city. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you something that you already know for starters, which is that the state, the county, and the city are constrained in what they can do in terms of the gun problem, given larger, you know, larger, um, larger issues. Now, one thing that, um, you know, one thing that we, we see often is, um, in other, in, in, you know, in places like, um, like California, where they've been a little bit out ahead around things like, um, like red flag laws. So if somebody shows signs of, um, uh, of, you know, documented mental illness, for instance, or someone gets convicted of a felony, and so then they're legally under federal law and no longer allowed to have a gun. Um, going to the person's house and getting their guns as you can imagine, giving every, given everything else going on, has traditionally been viewed as maybe not the very top priority of law enforcement. And there are a bunch of complications around, like how do you know someone is really mentally ill? And like that's that's just some that's just intrinsically difficult because like we have a bunch of privacy concerns over people for mental health treatment. We want to be respectful of that, but whatever. Like we have to sort of figure that out, but. Once we've established that someone should no longer legally have a gun, I think you could imagine it being very, very useful for the county to make sure that we're getting guns out of that person's home. Um, and I think when you look at other places that have been trying to do that, they, they tend not to do it as well as they should. And so I think, I think doing that really well would be helpful. And the second thing that I would, um, I would say is, um, I think one thing that's very underappreciated with the current pandemic is we focus on the physical health consequences of COVID, but the mental health consequences are sort of the, the iceberg below the surface. The CDC did a survey, the Centers for Disease Control did a survey in the summer of 2020 and found that like when you look at 18 to 24 year olds, something like 70% of all 18 to 24 year olds in America said that they were experiencing mental health problems related to the pandemic. And one in four 18 to 24 year olds said they'd considered suicide the last 30 days. So you take a, and even before the pandemic, America was like not great at diagnosing mental health problems and then ensuring there's adequate access to treatment. So you take a once in a hundred year 
mental health crisis and combine that with 400 million guns, it's not clear that we should be surprised by what we're seeing, unfortunately, with the massive prevalence of mass shootings that we're seeing, not just in Cook County, but all across the country. And so I think as a complement to ensuring we're doing a really good job on things like red flag laws, I think anything that the county can do to be creative in improving mental health screening and access to mental health treatment. And, and I, do, I think, you know, I have, I have friends at the Harvard Medical School who are trying to be creative and think about things like telehealth to, you know, get mental health treatment out to more people than we normally treat. Like, I think any sort of creative solution like that that the county can contribute to would be super, super helpful. Very much appreciate that. I, I think that uh, we probably should uh, move along. I do want to make one observation, uh, and then I'll turn it back to the chair. Uh, uh, so um, the um, Professor Ludwig has very generously agreed to collaborate with the commission in, in incubating actionable policy recommendations. And I'm deeply grateful to you, gents, for your uh, kind offer to do that. And uh, Commissioner Alston has agreed to chair a working group around these topics. Uh, unfortunately, he's unable to be with us uh, today. However, uh, anyone who is interested in participating in that working group, please feel free to reach out directly to Commissioner Alston or to me, and I'll connect you, uh, because obviously this is a topic of uh, enormous societal importance. And uh, to the extent that uh, you have an interest in any aspect of this, and there are lots of aspects, uh, please uh, step up and uh, we'll all welcome your participation. And I too will be part of that working group because this is something of great importance to me uh, personally as well. So, um, so Jens, uh, thank you again for being with us. You're more than welcome to stick around for the balance of our uh, meeting. If you have other things to do, we'll understand that. But we're very grateful for your time today and your uh, and your very significant contributions to our to our understanding of these problems. Well, th thank you very much for for having me, and and please don't hesitate to. I, I look forward to continuing the conversation and doing whatever I can to be helpful. Thank you, thank so, you so much. much I'll move this over to uh, the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and uh, this was a, a extremely. Um, important conversation to have. So I'm excited that we are able to start that end and move forward with uh, with an agenda on, on that end. Um, we are gonna move over to uh, the following item um, that we have pending for this um, commission meeting, uh, which will be the presentation from the Bureau of Economic Development. Um, I know uh, we're running a little behind. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have um, the Bureau present um, on ARPA, uh, funding. I know that's been something that the commission has been asking um, about, and uh, we were able to uh, thankfully have uh, one of our commission members, such as uh, Flores, um, Bureau Chief, uh, to uh, the Bureau, uh, able to uh, formulate a presentation and go into detail around that. Um, I know that there's going to be a lot of areas and overlaps of some of our conversations from previous um, presentations that we've had here, uh, but uh, also even uh, today uh, in regards to gun violence and, um, you know, uh, figuring out uh, opportunities for funding uh, recidivism prevention and such. So I will hand it over to our Bureau Chief and I, I believe somebody will be sharing the presentation um, and we will go from there. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you everyone. And I I believe Liz will pull up our presentation and I um I need someone to give me permission. Yeah, I, I can make you co-host really quick. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Dahlia. Well, thank you everyone. And I know we are um we have a short amount of time to get through quite a bit of information. So I do want to get to the meat of our of our presentation. I know, and I also want to provide an opportunity for the commissioners to ask questions because they're is quite a bit of exciting work that the Bureau of Economic Development is leading on behalf of the county. Um, initiatives around housing, community development, workforce, and small business. And I know that those are all topics that we are all very interested in exploring and figuring out opportunities to further align. 
Um, so I'm going to flip quickly through some of the beginning slides. And this deck will be shared with each of you. So I encourage you to review it. And obviously I'm on the commission, so you can always ping me if we need to have a follow-up discussion. But I do want to provide an opportunity for my team that, that's joining me today to talk about our work. Um, so with me today, I have my two deputies. Irene Scher oversees our business side of the shop and our economic development side. And Dominic Tosi um, is the second deputy overseeing the community development work. Additionally, I have um, Liz Shu, our director of policy that um, is joining us as well and has been working on many of these initiatives along with not just the Bureau of Economic Development, but other members of the county, including Transportation and Bureau of Asset Management, the Justice Advisory Council, because we know community development links across all entities, and we want to make sure that our work is holistic. Um, so just a little bit of background on the Bureau. The Bureau was created under President Preckwinkle's administration and um, to align and streamline the efforts of the departments of of community development or planning and development, building and zoning, and the Zoning Board of Appeals. So we are a fairly new bureau, um, but our work is grounded on, in six strategic priority areas that include investing in key cluster initiatives, supporting workforce, growing businesses, um, developing quality affordable housing, and also promoting initiatives that really strengthen our communities. Fortunately, this pre-pandemic framework that has grounded our work also um, ensures that we promote equitable economic growth and community development. And this has been the foundation of all the work that we've been doing throughout ARPA. Uh, next slide, Liz. And I'm just going to quickly jump through this, but this slide provides um, a quick glimpse of our, of our ARPA funded initiatives. And in 2022, um, our initiatives will span five key themes. So household assistance and social services. So we have programs that focus on helping residents meet immediate housing and financial needs via direct assistance. You'll hear a bit about these programs um, shortly from Dominic. Uh, the next area, Dominic will also hit on a few key initiatives, but around housing. We want to invest our programs that provide emergency shelter, housing, and medical respite for the unhoused. Um, on the other side of our shop, we have our small business agenda, where we are continuing to expand our support for small businesses. So that's been a very needed and very successful new initiative that we have undertaken. Um, fortunately, we have a very um, robust team of, of experts that have joined us in that work. We have a large group of business support organizations that have been on the ground helping us develop what our small business agenda has become. Uh, the next area is our sector support and regional development that really focuses on the recovery of tourism, hospitality, and creative industries, as well as assisting manufacturers in rebounding um, from COVID by investing in technology and supply chains. So um, those th that area of work falls under Irene. She'll be jumping in and talking a little bit more about that. The final area that she will hit on is our worker support and workforce development. Um, so again, I wanna keep it short and sweet so that we can get to the meat of our presentation. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my team. All right, thanks, Sochi. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dom Tassi, the, the Deputy Bureau Chief of um, Community Development, and wanted to, I mean, you just saw Sochi talk about the breadth of our programs and um, be happy to come back and dig in, in in a future meeting to any of those programs that, that folks are interested in and want to hear more on. Today on the community development side, we're going to focus on two of, two of the programs uh, that were on that, that big list. Uh, one around our guaranteed income pilot that I'll touch on, and then my colleague Liz will talk through the Transforming Places Place Space Initiative. Um, you know, on guaranteed income, hopefully a lot of you have heard, 
Uh, the county is moving forward with a guaranteed income pilot, and it's really building on two things. One was uh, our one-time direct cash assistance program that we did uh, in late 2020 as part of our COVID response effort. Uh, you know, we found that initiative uh, to be a very successful one. We ended up quadrupling what we had initial, initially allocated to that program. Uh, it was very kind of efficient and effective way of getting funding out to folks who needed it. And uh, we were able to help uh, all eligible applicants under that program uh, and really kind of hit the target populations uh, that, that we were uh, hoping to hit. Um, and then second, um, you know, we're kind of taking this next step into a guaranteed income pilot uh, beyond the one-time assistance, uh, really driven by the results we're seeing from pilots that are going around around the U.S. and, and also just stemming from our belief that um, in, in so many cases, what low-income households really need is just uh, more cash. Um, so we've been excited about our successes so far, what we're seeing around the country, and, and you know, through this pilot, really focused on a few key goals that you see on the left-hand side of the slide uh, around, you know, seeing improvements in the, the financial stability, health, educational attainment, and, and so forth, and other outcomes uh, for the recipients. Um, we're also interested in, in learning about the impacts that this, uh, you know, cash being provided to households can have on uh, the local economy in terms of spillover effects and, and, and you know, what that means for, you know, where the, the household's receiving it. Um, and then also generating learnings around uh, what we have our eye on, a, you know, some form of a permanent program. Um, you know, the pilot, you can see some of the uh, kind of high level criteria on the right hand side, it will provide 3,250 households uh, $500 a month for 24 months. Um, and it'll be aimed at households at or below 250% of the federal poverty level. That's about $57,000 for a household of three, uh, just for a sense of that. Uh, will serve both city and suburban residents uh, with uh, a higher uh, number of recipients in suburban Cook County, um, just given that the city of Chicago is, is running a similar program. And a you know, really important piece, we're working with the University of Chicago uh, on a really re really thorough evaluation of the program, uh, you know, in, in part to you know, both understand the outcomes and think about uh, you know, its effects on, uh, on certain subpopulations and what might make the most sense uh, in terms of a, a a permanent county program, um, if that's the direction we head in. Next slide, please, Liz. You know, on the, the Y side of guaranteed income, I kind of referenced it a little bit earlier, but I think really kind of you know, moving forward on our with our belief that uh, we want to trust and invest in our Cook County households, that they know best. Um, what they need uh, and, and how to allocate their resources and really just giving some, them some additional uh, funding to meet their needs. Uh, I referenced kind of our satisfactory experience with the one-time cash assistance program in terms of the administrative burden um, you know, versus a lot of other types of social safety net programs, um, you know, lower administrative costs, but also you know, very quick to to uh, help participants and see some impacts. And again, uh, we've seen a number of pilot studies showing early results around the country uh, with really promising uh, results around workforce participation, um, you know, households and individuals using that funding to pursue entrepreneurial activities, uh, things they you know, just haven't been able to do. So um, we're excited to move this forward in terms of where we're at right now. We are uh, bringing to the county board later this month um, our, uh, an agreement with our payment administrator partner um, and starting to dig into uh, creation of the application and, and all the, the pieces that come with that. We are um, aiming for a release of the app application for households in the fall and 
uh, first payments out by the end of the year. So with that, I will turn it over to Liz to talk about our Transforming Places project. Thanks, Tom. Um, and again, I'm Liz Shu, Director of Policy within the Bureau of Economic Development. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about our Transforming Places pilot that we are implementing uh, in partnership with the United Way. Uh, we're doing this because it was, was a direct recommendation of the Cook County Equity Fund report that was published earlier this year, specifically with the goal to really think about residents and local businesses as the experts on their needs and what their communities want. Um, and find new ways to center county investments based on those needs. So we are going to uh, implement a pilot program spending $15 million across five suburban communities, uh, as well as potentially some of the existing United Way neighborhood networks, which I'll, I'll show uh, on uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, United Way is going to be our implementation partner here. Uh, and they will provide a variety of supports to local nonprofits in each of these communities to help build up a neighborhood network. Uh, they call the local nonprofit a community quarterback, uh, and their role really is to help over the course of three years uh, create a plan uh, with a clear set of implementation steps and needs, um, identify stakeholders to participate in the implementation, and help residents and local businesses businesses build the networks, funding resources, um, and other resources that, that they might need to really implement that plan over the long term. Uh, overall, uh, you know, we're not just thinking about long term, we do also want to invest in meeting in immediate needs. So for example, some of these communities have uh, very clear and immediate concerns about food access or accessing public health resources. And that's something that we hope the county can bring resources to bear on. Um, and then finally, I mentioned this already, but we really do want to focus on implementation. How can we help people put programs in place, uh, build infrastructure that they need and similar, uh, and then connect to county resources. So uh, United Way has run this program for a number of years. Many of the neighborhood networks provide very strong resources around social services, public health, education, public safety. Uh, and we are hoping that we can bring the county's expertise and resources in other areas to bear. So thinking about economic development, infrastructure, capital investment, um, and additional resources um, in public health and related areas. If you are not familiar with a place-based approach, um, and I know many of you might be familiar with one that's a little bit more real estate focused, um, place-based investment is, is essentially kind of a set of common themes in a geographically defined area. So the community, in this case, really meaning the local residents, local businesses, defines what their needs are and defines what their solutions are. Um, over implementation, all of that is still guided by the community. So you set up through this local nonprofit, a steering committee of residents and businesses to guide implementation, help track it and make sure that every action is continuing to meet those locally defined needs. Uh, and then ideally, you are also setting up sustained investment on the part of the public sector, um, philanthropic investment and private investment. And then just a little bit about this program and how the county investment is gonna play out. Um, you see on the screen a map of almost all of the existing neighborhood networks for United Way. There is one out in West Chicago that is off the map. Uh, we would like to create five more of these in suburban communities over the next three years. Uh, we are in the first phases of that, uh, where we are selecting communities via a data-driven process, a subset of communities who we will then reach out to about participation uh, in the program. We hope to launch the initial two <laughs> networks uh, this fall, as well as identify any opportunities where, again, we can bring county expertise or resources to some of those existing neighborhood networks, um, launch the final three networks in winter uh, 2023, um, and complete the network building process with United Way uh, through 2025. So with that, and to keep all of you moving, I'm gonna hand off to Irene. Hello, everybody. Um, so this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we call talent solutions. And this is really how the Bureau of Economic Development thinks about workforce. 
Um, all of you know the Chicago <coughs> Cook Workforce Partnership. They are the official workforce agency for Cook County and the city of Chicago. Their focus is on job training, um, counseling, advising for people looking for work. The Bureau of Economic Development focuses on the needs of employers and looks at it for that through that lens. Um, Talent-driven economic development is, is kind of a catchphrase these days because talent and the need for talent is the single most important issue these days for employers. So we could go to the next slide. And uh, so as part of ARPA, the county uh, is investing $15 million of ARPA funds with the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership to focus on the urgent hiring needs of employers. And the focus is on, um, I think someone was referring to them before, opportunity youth, out of work, out of school, youth and young adults individuals with disabilities and other barriers to employment and formerly incarcerated individuals. And we also have launched a new program called Opportunity Summer. These are paid internships uh, that are sector-based and offer career pathways. So this is based on the county's successful program Opportunity Works, which is also going to be ex expanded significantly with ARPA funds. Um, but we have a first uh, summer program going on right now. And in total, these programs, we believe, will serve approximately 13,000 residents and impact 500 businesses through either hiring or events or things like that. Um, and we call all of this work career connector. And we could go to the next slide. And then these are our, our current hiring events and we have a series of them. Uh, I think I saw Reggie on the call. His group is very involved in leading uh, the upcoming event on July 21st at Morton College. And, oh no, maybe it's the July 30th one. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but anyway, these events uh, bring employers together with potential employees and people get hired on the spot and we're really excited about it. Um, we've really been trying to engage county agencies. So the Cook County Hospital has been at the events. Uh, we're hoping the forest preserves will be there. Um, and, you know, we have, some of them are sector-based, so we've had some that are focused on manufacturing, but otherwise they're really um, cover everything from healthcare to IT to TDNL, transportation distribution and logistics. Um, so we really can use your help in getting the word out for these events. And uh, this, this um, PowerPoint has a page at the back with links that will give you more information, but uh, we love getting input and engagement and help getting the word out from groups like the Social Innovation Commission. We could go to the next slide. Um, small business agenda. This is something Sochi mentioned earlier. Uh, I will say the lovely looking individuals on the left side of the screen are the program managers on our, in our in BED. And um, they are relatively new and we are excited that we've been able to bring on some new staff to support this work. We could go to the next slide. And the county really got involved in small businesses. We were thinking about it. We were on the cusp of doing things right before COVID started. And up to that point, the county did a lot of work with larger businesses, did work that was real estate driven, but really didn't have resources uh, to support small um, businesses. And so COVID came and that really catalyzed us and turned out to be somewhat in this context only a blessing in that it gave us funds to launch this program. And so we joined a network of what we call business support organizations and Chicago Community Trust to provide business advising services one-on-one -on -one, um, 
from various organizations like Women's Business Development Center, the Urban League. Um, there's 10 of what we call lead BSOs. Um, and we have a resource library and events and webinars to help businesses navigate what definitely was an overwhelming array of programs and agencies all initially trying to help businesses recover from COVID. Um, so we've been doing that for about a year and a half. We go to the next slide and feel very good about our work so far. We've touched about 10,000 small businesses. Most of the businesses we work with are less than 20. Most of them are less than five. Um, during COVID, we distributed $17 million of small grants, $10,000 um, per business. And we've provided business advising services to about 2,700 businesses. And then you can see some of the numbers in terms of the populations that we have been serving. Um, and we feel good about those and think, but think there's room for us to do more to um, ensure that organ communities and individuals that have not always had access to these resources have that. We go to the next slide. And then lastly, I'll just say we have, and you'll be hearing a lot about it in the next probably month or so, we, we do have a small business grant program that's going to be funded with ARPA funds. Uh, $26 million are going to be recovery grants. And we have a small business advisory committee, and it's under the auspices of EDAC, which is chaired by Howard. Um, and this group uh, developed a kind of a vision, ambition statement for how we want to deploy these funds. And uh, this was important for the group and we think will be a North Star for our work and how we develop our evaluation, scoring, prioritization of applications. But um, what we really hope to do is to support underserved businesses at a rate higher than their demographic representation within the county population. So um, that will be a first and We'll see how we do. Uh, that is, I think that's my last slide. Yes. Great. Thanks, Irene. Thanks, team. Um, with that, I want to just give us an opportunity to pause there. And I know we don't have tons of time, but give people an opportunity to ask any questions. This deck includes my team's contact information. So obviously, Feel free to connect with us. Let us know if um, you have any questions or would like to discuss any of these items further. Um, additionally, there's some great resources that are included in our deck, um, our website. So if you can share any of this information, there are links to toolkits because we're trying to ensure that all of our communities um, hear about these great programs. So I know that each of our commissioners within this commission have a broad network of of um, context so please share it these are great programs and want to ensure that both residents and businesses learn about these things so with that i will turn it over back to commissioner naya to take us through questions thank you so much bureau uh, chief um, flores for uh, the information uh, provided I did see that Christy was asking um, to see if uh, the presentation would be able to be shared. I believe that, that that won't be a problem. All of that information is public. So we, we will be able to uh, send it over to um, all commission members. Um, and I will open it up if there's any questions regarding any of the programs or uh, any of the opportunities uh, that ARPA is going to allow the county to be involved in, 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 in the programming. I don't see any hands on my end. Um, so we'll probably uh, send over um, the details. And if there is anything, I'm sure we'll provide an opportunity of uh, Bureau Chief Flores um, at the next meeting for any questions, uh, if anybody would like to just kind of 
you know, digest that uh, presentation and, and come back with questions. Commissioner, it's Howard. I just want to congratulate the, the, the incredible work that the Bureau has done with the leadership that you have just heard from. It's uh, taken form under, I think, some real uh, challenging circumstances where the need was there, but we didn't necessarily know how we could get it together. And uh, I've never heard a uh, word of complaint from the most overworked. Well, everyone feels they're overworked, but this bureau has been doing an amazing job. And I want to congratulate all those people. And of course, Soshi and Irene and Dom um, and, and Liz. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We echo that and we thank uh, Bureau Chief Flores and, and her wonderful team for being so proactively looking for opportunities and uh, in taking information and uh, concepts that have been presented in, in various forms uh, to be able to provide a very proactive um, structure going forward for the Bureau um, and for the different programs. So, so thank you so very much. Um, I know we are extremely proud as, as Board of Commissioners um, that we have such amazing and robust programming coming in the next few years. So, so thank you again for, for that. Um, with, uh, I know we're running out of time, so I will, and I don't see any other questions, so I'll, I'll uh, maybe switch it over to our Vice Chair Lane um, for any updates on the committees. Uh, oh, thanks, and I would like to add my uh, thanks to uh, the group that just presented uh, for their presentation, but more important for their achievements and for moving the dial, extraordinarily important to all of us. So thanks to each and every one of you. Um, Madam Chair, may I ask, are we bound by the six o'clock deadline or if we run over a little bit, are we gonna be okay? I think we should be okay um, as long as we don't, I mean, I think a few folks might need to jump off, but I yeah, think- Yeah, clearly. I just wanted to give everyone that has a working group report to have that opportunity. So we'll, we'll do this as uh, efficiently as we can. So let me just kind of take this from the top. Uh, Commissioner Freeman, do you have a report on the uh, on the progress of the Community Investment Vehicle Working Group? Has Commissioner Freeman left? Yes, I, I don't think she's here, yeah. yeah. I believe she had to um, log off, but she sent one to me, Alma, and Mark. Okay. So, oh, um, then, uh, Vice yeah. Chair, we, we may be able to just forward that over to um, all members as long as nobody replies. Uh, yeah, why don't we why don't we do that and we can uh, invite a more fulsome report uh, next meeting? Uh, Commissioner Aglipay, do you have a report on the Diverse Talent Pipeline Working Group? Assuming Commissioner Aglipay is here. Not so. Okay. Well, if we, we we learn a lesson here, if we defer this uh, to the very end of the meeting, uh, it ends up that we uh, have a much briefer series of presentations. Um, Commissioner Yonan, are you still with us? I am. Yes. Great. Um, do you have a report to us on the underutilized church property working group? I do. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. So Thank you. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. So on June 22nd, the Social Innovation Committee on Church Property um, had a meeting. Vice Chair Lane was in attendance along with Christy, Roger, and uh, myself. And so I helped facilitate the discussion. And just a couple highlight notes on that is that our focus, you know, uh, was really to see what role that the commission could play in help incubating the program. So possibly, you know, conveying some meetings with some of the faith leaders to get an understanding of how or if they might be marketing their needs was discussed. Um, and then just kind of get to feel out what some of the challenge might be with, you know, the fact that some of these um, uh, faith-based organizations may have challenges with a centralized congregation. Uh, discussions of the committee's familiarity with um, similar programs was um, kind of discussed with um, Reverend Brazier's Apostolic Church of God in Woodlawn um, kind of being a model that was used. Uh, I know Christy De Laurentiis had talked about some possible land that uh, was purchased by Catholic Charities um, in Olympia Fields. That's a large tract of land that uh, she was going to look in to see if some of the ideas of trying to rezone it for some type of, 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 of other property like uh, senior, senior Citizen Center. Um, and I know, unfortunately, Christy had had to take off, but she had um, 
wanted to try to get a uh, meeting uh, on the South Suburban Mayors and Managers agenda. Um, and so that is scheduled for some time here in early July to be able to just kind of get a feeler for what some of the mayors and managers really see as, as challenges that either from the zoning um, aspect of things or ways that uh, might have been kind of uh, 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 concerns that have come up in the past. So um, that's kind of where she's going to uh, try to use that as a way to be able to kind of give us ideas of, of how to, again, see if how we're going to be conveying some of these faith-based leaders. Um, and then um, looking at some other partners, the discussions of housing collaboratives was out there with the institutional knowledge they have, uh, uh, reaching out to faith um, in place organizations to get an understanding of what they see the landscape as being. And so in summary, perhaps just again, an opportunity to convey a couple meetings to be able to create a task force or an advisory group that will assist the task force or a working group. Uh, create a couple panels where experts could give ideas of how to grow their assets and how to they've evolved their ways to meet some of their congregational needs and then get them to focus on some resource allocations by revisiting some of their congregations needs. And then finally, um, the discussions of possibly bringing Mark Edelson back to see what ways he can advise us to create to to uh, be more creative and thinking out of the box of how to get some of these growth ideas incubated. So uh, those are some of the notes. But uh, again, I know uh, there'll be some follow up discussions with Christie's outreach with the mayors and managers, and uh, we'll report back after that. John, thank you for your presentation and lightning speed. It's a reflection of how quickly your mind works, and we're grateful to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, I know that uh, Commissioner Anderson is not here this evening. Is there uh, anyone that has a report on behalf of the reparations working group? Uh, not hearing anyone. I think we will then move to the final working group, and that is uh, Commissioner Killen. Do you have a report on the electric vehicle uh, working group? Yep, the group has yet to meet, so no update to report at this time. Look forward to con connecting and providing an update at the next meeting. Very much appreciated. And uh, Madam Chair, I think it's back in your hands. Great, um, record speed indeed. Um, so we'll, uh, we have about three minutes. So um, what I'll do is I'll open it up for any final comments, uh, announcements, et cetera, and then we will adjourn. Um, I see Commissioner Malone had her hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, obviously, these, these commission meetings are always very enlightening. So thank you again, uh, Chair Naya and Vice Chair Lane for your time and your leadership. Um, just wanted to broach a couple of things uh, because I have not seen announcements about these. And I think it's important as the Social Innovation Commission for us to be aware and mindful. We are two weeks since the overturn of Roe and we have not had any jurisdictional level of government announce even a task force about what it means for us to be a welcoming city, how Cook County Health and Hospitals are going to be overwhelmed. The Illinois Reproductive Health Act only covers insurance for Illinois people. So if you come from out of state and you are underserved and you use Cook County Health, you are not gonna be able to use the insurance for abortion. So like there's a lot going on um, and we're gonna have homelessness challenges. We're going to have all kinds of issues. I was really excited to see hotel-based hotel sheltering in the ARPA funds uh, because this type of stuff is gonna be critical. And so we do not, we know there's not been a public announcement from anyone about a task force that does reproductive justice, women's rights, and how we are preparing the city, the county, and the state to take on an influx of people. And as a person who has housed women from out of state for abortions with Midwest Access Coalition, I can tell you that it's not one person, it's a person and their siblings and their children and their parent and their spouse that come. So I'm really, really concerned about that. And I just wanted to flag it. We are also heading into a downturn and a recession. And so while I'm super excited about all of the work that BED is doing, also want to have a conversation about um, comprehensive cost of living, reducing stressors, uh, economic stressors on households, um, and eliminating economic stressors on households and resident retention as we prepare to head into a recession and, uh, and, and grave economic danger. So uh, those two things just wanted to broach row and economic danger. Uh, we, we need to come up with something for both and, and it's pretty timely. So just wanted to flag. Thank you, Morgan, very important points. Appreciate that. Thank you, duly noted. Um, great, so we're gonna actually finish on time. Uh, this commission is so efficient. So I appreciate you all sticking around um, and we'll open it up. I don't see any other hands. So we'll open it up to uh, adjourn.
Can I uh, get a motion from a member, please? Motion, we adjourn. Second. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Mills, uh, and then Commissioner Yonan um, seconds. Um, all those in favor, signify by Aye. saying. Aye. 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 No opposed. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We will continue conversations within the committees um, and also uh, in our next meeting. Have Great a wonderful meeting. day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Stay Have safe. Be well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan.